Those Were the Days is filmed before a live internet audience. Hello, everybody, and welcome into Those Were the Days. It's a show where we look at Stone Age television through a modern lens with nostalgic eyes. I am your host this week, Travis, a.k.a. TV's Travis. And look, I can't do this alone. I need some help, okay? So helping me out this week is the modern Stone Age family man, Stephen. Yes, I'll have a Bronto burger with some Tyrannosaurus fries and a side of pterodactyl sauce. Oh, yeah, and some rock cakes. Too early to get some rock cakes? <laughs> uh, just happy to be here as all get out because he is one excited dinosaur. Audie. We're Flintstones, kids. <laughs> Ten million strong and growing. And having taken all of her Flintstones vitamins today, it's Amy. <clears throat> Sorry, I uh, I don't know what happened there. Uh, uh, and so we are talking about the Flintstones this week. But before we get too deep into the Flintstones, we're starting a new topic. Our next four episodes are going to be all about <clears throat> jumping the shark. Now, jumping the shark can mean a few different things. There's some debate. There was some debate going on in the Those Were the Days water cooler about what exactly Jumping the <laughs> Shark was. Um, it is, uh, the, the name comes from Happy Days, uh, specifically an episode where Arthur Fonzarelli literally water ski jumps over a damn shark. Um, it, there's a couple of different kind of schools of thought of what Jumping the Shark is. Uh, some people believe that it's sort of the tipping point of where a show loses its edge, changes um, and is kind of, it's irreversible, never, never gets back what it had. Other times, other people believe that jumping the shark is just kind of a moment in a show that just is crazy and outlandish and makes no sense whatsoever. Um, this episode we're talking about this week kind of does both, but before we get too far into that, uh, Steven, where do you land on that spectrum? Uh, I, the well, I don't know if I want to give away the foreshadowing of what my episode eventually will be, but... I kind of like the idea that uh, a Jumping the Shark show is a show that has an episode that just doesn't fit with the rest of the episodes. It, to me, I think it can be a great episode of television, maybe some of the best television, but it's just like a standalone, what were they thinking, who wrote this, how much coke did they do kind of thing. <laughs> uh, that's, that's where I'm at on that. I, I much prefer to think of it as just a a wild left field idea in a show that generally doesn't have those. That's where I'm sure. At. Okay. Audie, how about you? Where, where are you on the jumping the shark argument? Yeah, I think I'm kind of there the same as Steven. Like, here's the thing. I, I was trying to find a jumping the shark episode and realize so many of them are from shows I didn't watch or care about at all. So trying yeah. to find something that fit. And like, I was telling, uh, you guys in the Discord just before we started, the one I had went to a premium tier on freaking Peacock, and I was like, "Dang it!" So yeah, um, yeah. I think I tend to side with it's something that either is really out there or is just absolutely a change in direction of the show. Okay, one way right. or another. A okay, and Amy, you fall where? I'm like I'm mostly on the like for, especially for the purposes of this show i'm very much on the like it's just like something out there something out of character it doesn't necessarily have to mean that it's the downfall of the show um and i don't think it's like i really prefer you know like because it's something weird and out there and it's not mm. it's not just like oh we've made this decision and things have gone poorly from there it's we've made this decision that no one can understand how we've made right? regardless of what happens afterwards. All right. And I kind of feel like it's, it's a turning point in a show. It's not necessarily when a show gets bad. I don't, I don't fully subscribe to that, but it's after that point in a show, things kind of never go back to what they were. Um, sometimes it's introducing a new character 
Uh, sometimes it's a character leaving a show. Um, oftentimes a show can go on for quite a while and still be very good. The jump, the, the idea of Fonzie jumping the shark in happy days, there were still a couple of seasons and some great episodes after that. Like it, it yeah. wasn't like the show suddenly got terrible. Um, you know, I can think of a couple of moments in like the X-Files, for instance, that were kind of shark jumping moments that changed the series uh, forever. And it, it kind of whether you think that that's good or bad is sort of, you you know, up to your own interpretation. But that's kind of where I land on it, which was why I went with the Great Kazoo in the Flintstones. So the Flintstones was a primetime animated sitcom, actually the first primetime animated sitcom. Um, it ran from 1960 until 1966. There were 166 episodes in the original run. It was heavily inspired by the honeymooners. Um, and the funny thing was in doing some research, um, William Hanna had said, yeah, we were totally inspired by the honeymooners. And that was like a big thing. And it was the biggest show on TV and all this. And Joe Barbera was like, no, we weren't, but I mean, this whole thing going on, Jackie Gleason actually thought about suing Hanna Barbera over it, um, and his lawyers, his lawyers were like, you know, you'd win, but do you want to be the guy that takes Fred Flintstone off the air? And so he didn't. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, I mean, it's it's clearly inspired by the Honeymooners. It's yeah. the Honeymooners set in uh, prehistoric times. But we've got uh, Fred Flintstone and his wife Wilma, um, and their dog, their pet dog Dino. And then in season three, they have a child. They have Pebbles. And I always forget that they didn't have Pebbles from the beginning. Like the first yeah. two seasons, almost, almost three full seasons without Pebbles around. Uh, and then you had his neighbor and best friend, Barney Rubble, um, and his wife, Betty. And then they get Bam Bam shortly after Pebbles is born. They adopt Bam. 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 Uh, and they have a... Uh, like a kangaroo dinosaur thing called Hoppy, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember that at all, though. I'll be completely honest. Um, so what I want to know is, starting with Audie, what is your history with the Flintstones? Did you watch this growing up? Because it was everywhere uh, mm -hmm. in syndication and reruns. There were, by the time we were, we were around, there were several TV movies, a theatrical film, like, it was everything. So what, what's your history with the Flintstones? Well, I definitely remember watching it growing up because I grew up in Atlanta, the home of Turner Broadcasting, who, right. you know, is in charge of Cartoon Network and all that stuff. So this stuff was playing all the time everywhere somewhere. So it was hard to avoid these cartoons. So definitely remember watching Flintstones. I couldn't tell you much besides what you've described, but, it, you know, every episode involved that. Um, and then... Before the movies, I definitely remember watching the Saturday morning cartoon, The Flintstones Kids, when it was like they were children. You know, yeah. it was like the Muppet Babies yeah. versions of The Flintstones. And I remember yeah, watching or, that. Yeah, or A Pup Named Scooby-Doo was another one that did that. That right. was kind of a trend for a little while. It was. I couldn't tell you anything more about that. Definitely remember seeing some of the movies. Um, the only joke I remember from those movies was when they were like, oh, no, here comes a pterodactyl, and it just pooped on an entire car. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's a good joke. Don't remember the rest of that movie, but whatever. Okay. Oh, the you're talking about the live action movies, right? Yeah, mm -hmm, the yeah. live action movies. Um, Which, by the way, has there ever been a better casting of a cartoon character than John Goodman? Nope. No. Nope. Stone, like, no. Nope. No. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> nailed it. You know, and and it's a bummer for Mark Addy who played him in the sequel that mm -hmm. he had to follow John Goodman because that's just not fair. I mean, and he's a good actor in his own right. I didn't recognize him when that movie yeah. came out, but like afterwards, I'm like, oh, I know that dude. Oh, yeah. He deserved more credit for this. But that was just he bad. really did. If he had started as Fred instead yeah. of having to follow John Goodman, it would have been better. But mm -hmm. yeah. all right. Uh, how about you, Amy? Did you watch much of the Flintstones? I definitely did. It was the Flintstones and the Jetsons. And yes. um, I think it was mostly all of the appliances that really got me. Right, the, It's a living, you know, which it was like none of in this episode, which was a bit of a bummer. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, like the can opener in particular, I do very much remember. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, I used to watch this all the time. Oh, my gosh. And now I'm seen... watching. I'm like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> there are some recent... Yeah 
Flintstones comics where they go dark with some <laughs> of the concepts, like the animals controlling stuff. Like they talk to each other. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I'm here until I die. I know that. And then they'll get another one kind of thing. Like, yikes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen, how about you? Did you watch much of the Flintstones? Oh, yeah. It shocked me when you said this ended in 1966. I'm like, no, I really remember this being a large part of my childhood. And I was born mm -hmm. in 85. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're talking right. about staying power for a, a show that only lasted six years in the 60s? Holy cow. Um, I yeah. mean, for one thing, the vitamins, I took them every day. Thank you, yeah. Audie, for that mm -hmm. song. I mean, I took my Flint. That's why I'm so mighty and strong right now, you know. Uh, it's because of the Flintstones. And I remember this, this show, the kids show, the Flintstones kids and Captain Caveman. I mean, Captain, mm -hmm. remember, oh, yeah. he was like Cousin It with a club. <laughs> Captain Caveman <laughs> much. Was, oh, yeah. was great. I remember that being awesome. I love the movie. When I was a kid, I still think it's got legs. It's fine. You know, it's, it's decent. Uh, I really enjoyed all that. I wanted to live in that world uh, after I watched that movie. I wanted everything to be made of rocks, and I wanted a car I could pedal with my feet. Um, but you can't do that. <laughs> you can't pedal your car with your feet, at least not at that speed, because I had one of the little red cars with the yellow roof, and we tried. Mm -hmm. And no, mm -hmm. you can't do that. It doesn't work, no. no matter how hard you try. But yeah, this was a huge nope. piece of my childhood. Loved the Flintstones. Love, love, love the Flintstones. Uh, and was shocked at some of the things my adult brain saw at this episode. So I'm excited to talk <laughs> about it with you. <laughs> I am I am very excited. I watched a good a good amount of the Flintstones, the Flintstones kids, the crossover stuff like the the TV movie, the Jetsons meet the Flintstones, Flintstones. all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so the show originated solely aimed at adults. It was very much just the, the honeymooners in Stone Age times. Um, but it over time grew more and more kid friendly, more and more juvenile, um, in the humor that they used. Um, the first two seasons were actually sponsored by Winston cigarettes and <laughs> you can find the old, uh, commercials because they would have to do mm -hmm. Winston cigarette commercials and you can find those. Um, the only to song be fair, I in can the play. 60s, oh, go ahead, Amy. I'm sorry. In the sixties, I, I don't think it, that it being a kid's show would have stopped cigarette companies from advertising. Truth. The only no, song but... I can play on a piano is the Winston Cigarettes theme song. <laughs> <laughs> My cousin taught it to me when I was five, and I've never forgotten it. <laughs> uh, starting in season three, uh, the show's sponsor was switched to Welch's Grapes, Welch's Grape Juice and Grape Jelly. Uh, and so the associated commercials would go from, you know, Fred or Barney smoking to Pebbles wanting grape juice. And and then Fred would uh, would explain the Welch's process of making grape juice and grape jelly <laughs> to her. Uh, so Where did I, I in show that. advertising go? Like, can we get that back? Like, that I should be that. a little sidebar yeah. for us. Is the would they actually had the actors at a show be like, "Hey, are you using the new Dawn soap?" Yes, the Dawn soap is very mild on my hands. Can you feel? I don't know if there's. <laughs> I don't know if they're still doing it, but I know soap operas started doing that for a while, yeah. like <laughs> modern soap operas. Oh, nice. I could I could see that. I, I mean, it's such a weird thing with product placement, right? Because there's like product mm. placement, but these were just straight up ads that would run like at the end of the episode. Yeah. And yeah. they're awesome because they're like old school radio ads where you'd have, you know, whatever the show title brought to you by and they'd, they'd do the commercial and then they'd start the show. Um, see, I love those too because so there, there is a nostalgia to them. Um, the episode that we watched was season six, episode eight, The Great Gazoo. At this point, the show had been on for a little over five years. Um, they had injected some youth with Pebbles and then Bam Bam. Uh, it was skewing more and more um, kids. They were, I think at this point, they were running Friday nights at like 7.30. They'd started off on like an 8.30 p.m. Uh, time slot. They were going earlier and earlier in the day. And so they wanted to change things up. And uh, so one of the writers created this character, the Great Gazoo. Um, by the way, there were some other names uh, proposed for the Great Gazoo. You ready to hear some of these? Yes, these are great. bring it. Okay, so other names proposed for the Great Gazoo. Professor Og, <laughs> Rip, Rip Van Zonk. <laughs> okay. Hocus the Pocus. <laughs> They're not even trying. That's a different yeah. show. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Puck, Dr. Puckwuck. <laughs> nope. nope. Yeah, there's uh, a reason you don't go with that one. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and my favorite, uh, Shagel Bexy Zinkus, or Old Shaggy for short. <laughs> no. That feels like somebody either uh, like read Superman comics and like Mr. Mixie Spitalik. That's exactly where I had my brain went when you said that, mm-hmm. Mr. Mixie Spitalik. And I do wonder, well, it wouldn't have been uh, because of the name didn't get used, but it also reminds me of Slarty Bartfast from uh, yes. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> so yeah. those those are some of the names. And The Great Gazoo is voiced by Harvey Corman. Mm-hmm. Uh, the great Harvey Corman. Uh, he was only in 11 episodes. But this was sort of like, huh. it really changed the tone of the show by this point. Because uh-huh. now we're throwing in aliens, time-traveling aliens and sci-fi into our sitcom about a family in the Stone Age. And, uh, and things just, and he's got magical powers. So the episode opens up. It's like most Flintstones episodes, a very simple premise, very, very basic plot. And it's just sort of hilarity ensues. But Fred wakes up and Wilma is, has got just a big stack of pancakes and sausages and it's his breakfast for him. And he's suspicious right away. (laughs) This was excellent fourth wall breaking. It was very good because Mm -hmm. as she is running off, Oh, I forgot your coffee. And she heads to the, to the kitchen to get him his coffee. And then he turns to the camera and is like, all right, so it's either A, uh, you know, something B or C, she wants something. And then you just hear Wilma, oh, Fred, I was thinking the C's have it. She wants something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so Wilma wants a date night with her and Fred and Barney and Betty. Uh, they want to, she wants them to go out to the new Chateau Rock and Blue, uh, which is a brand new restaurant that everybody has been to except for them. Fred's like, ah, no, we can't afford that. Uh, it costs a week's pay just to tip the the guy parking your car. So he uh, he gives her a very hearty maybe and leaves and heads for work. So he and Barney are on their way to work when uh, a object falls out of the sky and nearly hits the car. Um, so they dig the thing out. And while they're digging out this thing, which is just a metal sphere with like spikes sticking out of it, it starts talking to him, which that alone, they, they took that yeah. really well. Like you would, th- I would have freaked out a lot more had, uh, mm-hmm. had that happened to me. Mm-hmm. Well, so, I was also impressed that they had that big old shovel in the back of Fred's car. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, he works at a quarry. Well, I mean, he That's digs for a I'm, living. Yeah. 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 But in that tiny car that has a back of some sort, <laughs> that true. was my thing. They don't need jumper cables, Adi. Like, if they're going to get out of a situation, yeah, a shovel's probably going to be the tool to use. Truth. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so they open up the thing, and out pops a two-foot-tall green man calling himself the Great Gazoo. Uh, the Great Gazoo is um, really confused and shocked that he has been sent back to the Stone Age and uh, reveals that he is from the future, from the planet Zatox. He was one of the foremost scientists, but one simple little invention got him uh, conspired against and exiled and sent to the past uh, because he created essentially a doomsday machine, (laughs) which is very glossed over, I might add. Like he talks about it was a small button about the size of your fingernail that when you press it, all life and everything you know just disappears. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't freak out our cavemen at all they're more confused by him saying things like the 14th and 15th century. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, now Gazoo is here and he has to serve these two prehistoric dum-dums until he proves his worth and is able to go back. So Fred and Barney kind of react the way that you would expect in a way, because they're just sort of like, wait, you can give us stuff. And they just started asking for everything. Mm-hmm. He was like, I want a dress for my wife. I want toys for my kids. A, a Bronto burger, 20 bucks. Like they, and they just have this pile of stuff in the middle of the road when a policeman comes by. My favorite and that's thing that's when about, they find out that... Um, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say my favorite thing about that sequence is that everything he gives them is all stuff from their time and place. It's not like they got mm-hmm. 20 bucks from some other civilization. So I can't help but wonder, is he materializing this stuff because he knows what it looks like, or is he robbing it from somewhere else on the planet and distributing it in that spot? <laughs> I really feel like somewhere across the Pangea or wherever they are, there's somebody <laughs> missing a dress out of their closet. I mean, I got questions about the, the limits of Gazoo's power. That's all I'm saying. Well, uh, your questions are never going to get answered. <laughs> no. But 
Uh, we course. do find out that Fred and Barney are the only ones that can see him because a policeman rides up and Fred is like, well, you can explain it to him. And he goes, no, no, nobody can see me except you. And the policeman's ready to write him citations for having stolen merchandise, transporting the stolen merchandise and blocking the road when they convince Kazoo to, to make it all disappear. We don't want this now. Mm -hmm. I like love that. the, that the assumptions by this particular police officer. Right. <laughs> So everything disappears. Crap, must have stolen it. Yeah, look at these yeah. working class <laughs> gentlemen that work at the quarry. I know how much they make. <laughs> it's profiling. The policeman is profiling him. Yeah. And uh, so then he gets confused and rides off, which and Gazoo makes his bike disappear, uh, which was also pretty funny. <laughs> so Fre Fred and Barney decide, you know what? We can use this to our advantage. We can take the girls to Chateau um, Rock and Blue. And so they head home. And they're excited as all get out to tell Wilma and Betty about the Great Gazoo. And they do in detail. And Wilma and Betty take it in stride as just these two knuckleheads. Like, honestly, they you would think that they would want them committed, but it's Fred and Barney. They've done all sorts of crazy stuff. So, yeah, sure, yeah. whatever. Two foot tall green guy. Yeah. Ha ha ha. Funny. And uh, Fred even tries to get Gazoo. Like, I command you to, to show yourself. He's like, I can't do that, you dumb dumb. <laughs> really likes calling him a dumb dumb. Um, <laughs> we do find out that kids and and animals can see them though. Uh, yep. But but uh, Wilma and Betty, not a chance. Although he does have a little fun with them and turn them into chickens, turns them into hens as they're walking back to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. little, uh, mm, that didn't sit there. with me uh, well, Travis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I saw that and I was like, eh, there's a there's a joke that uh, that's aged like warm milk. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not gonna do it for me. <sighs> Dumb clucks it is, is what the uh, words they used. Yes, uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> there there is definitely humor of the time in this show. Uh, oh yeah, uh, mm -hmm. stuff that wouldn't wouldn't fly today. <laughs> but the honeymooners was so progressive. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. This is definitely like the, the uh, first thing that stood out to me is like, okay, wife's definitely got to like grovel to husband to go to the restaurant. Like, like, come on. Come on. So I have, yeah, I have things to say about that, but but we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, yeah, sure. So, so Fred and Barney end up getting uh, the dresses again, but this time they're gift wrapped and they give them to the girls and tell them they're going to take them to, to Rock and Blue. And Fred starts to come up with the story of how they got the money to take them there and how they got the money to get the dresses and they don't care. They're just like <laughs> fawning over the fact that they got stuff and they're getting to go out mm -hmm. to dinner. Uh -huh. So they go to dinner. <laughs> the same dress in different colors, by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they go to dinner and Fred now is supremely confident that everything's going to go fine because he can get whatever he needs. So He's given twenty dollars to the Mater D to get him a seat because they don't have a reservation. Which, uh, by uh, inflation, twenty dollars in nineteen sixty five, sixty six, yeah. is about one hundred and eighty two dollars today. Mm -hmm. I thought you were about to so, give me the inflation rate from bedrock to now, and I'm like, that's I was about to ask, <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, that's a lot, incalculable. <laughs> um, <laughs> so they 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 get their seat. Fred is like, uh, well. Then uh, Barney, Barney tells him, wait, but that was all the money we had. Well, how are we going to pay for dinner? He's like, that's fine. Gaz will, oh, he's already got a nickname for Great Gazoo. Gaz. <laughs> Gaz will give us the money when the check comes. It's okay. And then Barney's like, well, we got to get flowers for the, for the girls. So they get flowers, but don't think to ask him for money at that point. At no point do they think to ask him for money. For real. Ahead. They're dum-dums. No. They are dum-dums. Mm -hmm. Living up fair. to their name. Mm -hmm. So they they go in, they have their dinner. Fred says, bring us the fo four of your finest meals. Price is no object. We have no idea what they ate. But whatever it was, was expensive because their bill comes and it's $225, which again, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a, adjusted for inflation from mm -hmm. 1965, mm -hmm. is a little over $2,000 for dinner. Oh my God. <laughs> so that's wow. about $500 a person to eat at Chateau Rock and Blue. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Like that's where you go and you get the tiramisu, you eat it and you leave. Like, you know, <laughs> it's a dessert luxury mm -hmm. place. 
So yeah. it's it's based off of a the Fountain Blue in Miami. That was a very mm-hmm. big, famous, fancy restaurant in like it opened in the 50s, I think. And uh, so I went ahead and uh, flipped through their menu, their current, you know, menu. And there's stuff that's some money. But I'm saying that you are not getting to those kind of dollars till you start getting into the good bottles of wine. Like you just can't spend that much money unless you're buying the good wine. It, you have to work to spend that kind of money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is Fred, c- completely confident that he's going to have the money. So when the check comes and he says $225, no problem. Kazoo, $225, and nothing happens. <laughs> Kazoo is busy taking a nap. Mm-hmm. So they try to uh, they try to use the, well, we left our money at home or yeah. in the car. Outside. They just uh, say outside. <laughs> <laughs> that's right it was even lamer um yep. and uh they tried it and then they try to run the mater d who suddenly lost his french accent uh that so good <laughs> that was a joke i did quite quite i did like that like. one wait what happened to your accent it's for paying customers only which they're not <laughs> um so betty and wilma are like well, how much money do we have at home uh and they figure out they have enough in the vacation fund in the cookie jar so they just leave and Fred and Barney are stuck there washing dishes. Uh, Wilma and Betty come back. They pay the bill. They take them home. Um, everybody gets home. Fred and Barney are sitting in the car, kind of lamenting what happened and upset with Gazoo, who then just appears because he heard his name. <laughs> Wait, so there was such a good part, though, because the girls say goodnight to each other, right? And they don't say anything to the guys. And and one of them, I, I think it was Fred, is like, you know, oh, nobody says goodbye to the guy with the dishpan hands. <laughs> <laughs> so Gazoo shows up and Fred Fred is like, Fred and Barney are both like, come on, what happened tonight? Where were you? And, and Barney even asked him, how are we supposed to count on you if we can't count on you? And I love Gazoo's response. Not yep. only am I undependable, but I'm kind of a kook. <laughs> Why do you think I'm here? <laughs> And uh, and basically, Fred and Barney give up. Fred goes inside, and Wilma's there waiting for him. And she apologizes to him for everything that happened. For the yeah, night. right. Yeah, uh-huh. she yes. pressured him. She pressured him into going, and and all of this. <laughs> I could and hear then, Amy sighing uh, when I was seeing that part. <laughs> like I knew. <laughs> so then, uh, Fred and Wilma so kind of make up uh, with. A little bit of help from Gazoo as he uh, messes with the lights and gives her some flowers and everybody's mm-hmm. happy. And that's the end of the episode. Um, who oh boy, was this some 1960s uh, action going on here? Um, yeah. This is this is in a weird place for me because it's like you nowadays sit modern sitcoms. Husband's a buffoon. Wife knows it. Wife is witty. Gives him all the crap. This is like this weird place where husband's a buffoon, wife knows it, wife grovels anyway, which is like a whole different right. place. I'm like this is not this is not the TV I'm used to for sure. This is a different kind of animal. Even at the time, watch like some black and white sitcoms, like Dick Van Dyke Show, yeah. for instance, was like Laura Petrie. She was a doting wife, but she was also like Rob. What is wrong with you? You know that happened a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I like to think that they are I mean they are from the stone age they're clearly behind the times it's fine Yeah, it, it was but a different time <laughs> when dinosaurs and time, humans roamed the earth together yes. at the same time I was definitely like Wilma and Betty are not catching on until the very end of Fred and Barney's hey we got the money we got that we, we don't have the money because our alien benefactor won't listen to us <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I, the other part of it that really bugged me, like not only was it the kind of groveling to go and all of that, but as soon as they're given the dresses, just yeah. everything else evaporates and they're yep. just this vapid. They this don't question of, it at all. Not a, not a single thing. Like I'm sorry. Wilma is smarter than that. Yeah. Betty is yeah. smarter than that. They really are. Like there's other times during the, the series where they're shown to be smarter than that. To at have no the, point. Would I imagine that Fred or Barney would be capable of picking out a dress? No. Or knowing the no. proper size. There's no way. We're not even getting into the fact that they just didn't go to work. 
that day. I, oh, yeah. <laughs> they just oh, went true. home with an alien. They just like, they were on their way to work, met an alien and went home. And no one says a thing. Like, uh, Mr. No. Slate would have already fired them. Yeah, like, they're, they are yeah. fired. They, they don't, don't work have a job jobs where somebody goes, oh, well, I'm glad, I'm glad you're safe. They work a job that's like, be here on time because somebody's got to run the brontosaurus today. <laughs> it's it, it is an interesting thing because there is a lot of a lot of fun in the the Flintstones, but there's a lot of like questionable stuff. Uh, it is very much a product of his time. I went back and watched a couple of early episodes too. First of all, mm-hmm. do you remember that there are two theme songs to the Flintstones? No, because there are. Mm-mm. So we all know Flintstones meet the Flintstones. That didn't come along until season three. The first yeah. two seasons have an instrumental track that played over the opening. The opening was different. And what was weird was when it's when I started watching that episode that had it, uh, I did not remember it at all. Um, huh. And I then wonder if they as, updated them when they re aired them. When they went into syndication, they changed them yeah. all to have the Meet the Flintstones theme. Um, and it was like later on uh, somewhere you could see the first couple of seasons with the original opening because the original opening just has Fred like coming home from work. So like he's driving along in traffic and he stops at a tailor where there's like a, a dinosaur that leads up to the second floor. He goes inside and comes out with like a different shirt. And then he driving and, and he drives along and he just gets home and come, runs inside. And Wilma's got a, a TV tray with dinner on it. And he just grabs that as he runs by her and then comes back to give her a kiss on the cheek and hops into his chair to watch TV. Huh. It's very different. I vaguely remember that. Yeah. As I was watching it, as I got further along, I'm like, okay, I do remember seeing this, but I like, when I think of the Flintstones, it's immediately the theme song. Right. The Flintstones. Like it's just burned into your, into my memory. So and that yet, really I know what out. I'm YouTubing right after this. Yeah. Same. <laughs> <laughs> and if you ever get a chance, find the original um, Flagstones pilot. So this got started, uh, Hanna-Barbera, they, they made like a 90 second uh, animation that was a, a pilot. They were known as the Flagstones. It has Fred, Barney, Wilma, and Betty. Um, Betty voiced by June Lockhart, by the way, which was Ooh. crazy to hear. Uh, she did the pilot and then just wasn't picked up, like wasn't brought back for the series. And I guess that made her really upset with Hanna Barbera. Like she wouldn't, she refused to work with them for years because of that. Dang. Um, but it's a, it's an interesting, just little quick pilot. Uh, it doesn't have the same voice for Fred and Barney at all, uh, but it does have Wilma's voice actor. Uh, so hmm. that, that was interesting. But um, also Mel Blank does the voice of Barney mm-hmm. and, when you go back and watch early season episodes of the Flintstones, it's a completely different voice he's doing. He's doing that high yeah. pitch, like, hey, Fred, what are you doing today? Kind of voice, right? Yeah. That bothers mm-hmm. me yeah. so much. <laughs> so <laughs> much. I'm like, no, he Marty's started... got that more, really, you know, Yogi Bear style mm-hmm. thing going on. Yeah. Right. So Mel Blanc was doing that voice early on, and and even the characterization of Barney was different. Oh, yeah. On. He was much more of like a smart aleck. He was in a nasty car accident. Um, during the beginning of the third season. And there's actually five episodes that have a different voice actor, one of the Hanna-Barbera stable actors, doing Barney's voice while Mel Blanc was in the hospital. And then they wow. ended up like rigging up a recording studio around his hospital bed so, he could, so they could work <laughs> and keep going. And from that point on, he started doing the different characterization. He lowered the, the pitch of the voice and he started making him more of a buffoon. Yeah. So it was like there's pre and post car accident Barney. That's amazing. And you know that's Mel Blank that's wanting to do that because that man is crazy and wanting to just do voices oh, yeah. until he dies. <laughs> which he did. Yeah. Succeeded. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's just it's an odd show. I I feel like my memory of it is much better than the quality of the show. The show is very like simple and the jokes. Mm-hmm. It's got a laugh track, which a lot of Hanna-Barbera stuff has. Um, But it doesn't feel like the joke, like as many of the jokes landed for me in this as I would have thought they would have. Like I have had this memory of it being a little more timeless. And I don't know if the Jetsons was any better because it was around the same era. I think the Jetsons started in 62. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) The Jetsons did have Rosie, though. So they have 
Yeah, they did. We'll we'll see um, how that works. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of shark jumping, bringing on a character like the Great Gazoo this at this stage in the series, and it, it basically was kind of like the last gasp to try and do something new. And it changed the show and it added in this this other kooky character that didn't really fit with everything else. And only the kids can see him and Fred and Barney. And it's sort of, it didn't work. And the show ended up ending that season. So we got 11 appearances of the Great Gazoo. And yet he made it into the second of the live action movies as well. Uh, played <laughs> yeah, by he Cameron. did. That's right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I ever watched Viva Rock Vegas. I think I watched part well, of it enough to know about Mark Caddy playing uh, the obviously said playing mm-hmm. John Goodman, but you know what I mean. But it, Google that, the it images. Was... Google the images yeah. of Gazoo from this. It's <laughs> it, it's it's, it's hilarious, and somehow it is not the most annoying character that Alan Cumming has ever played. <laughs> I like Alan Cumming, and he's fine. I do too. I do. I know. I, I very much like him, but uh, his great Gazoo is annoying and meant to be uh and it's not his worst character um that would be playing the character of loki and son of the mask oh you never watched yeah. that one that's a sequel i did don't. skip mm-hmm. don't do it oh Just now don't. now i recognize everybody from the flintstones movie sequel like i didn't recognize <laughs> anyone now i'm like i know all these faces is steven baldwin yep. in there like what the, oh there's the great Kitsu. that's amazing <laughs> That's yeah. so good. Okay, I ain't even mad. I'm yeah. gonna watch this for fun. Um, <laughs> that's good stuff. Um, but yeah, in terms of shark jumping, I mean, the show was already kind of on a downward slide at this point, and it was sort of petering out anyway. And six seasons of a sitcom is a fair amount when your yeah. premise is so simple. I mean, there's 166 episodes, and yeah, I was gonna say these are not 10 episode seasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's 24 to, to uh, I think season two was like 32 episodes, and you know if it was running now, I mean, because the closest analog I could give to it would be something like The Simpsons, and The Simpsons was sort of the Flintstones of the late 80s, and it just has kept going and somehow yeah. has kept the ratings. And so it's entering what? It's like 95th season at this point. Yeah, something like that. Mm-hmm. Like that. Yep. Um, and the Flintstones obviously couldn't carry that, but it also was only network. There wasn't any other, there weren't other options at that point. Like yeah. the, the bar for um, ratings was much higher because it started right. off. It was high. I mean, it was like a 24 in terms of ratings. Like it's a, it was a crazy number. It was one of the, it was the first animated series to get nominated for an Emmy. A primetime Emmy. Wow. Wow, that's awesome. That's cool. For for outstanding comedy show. It lost to the Jack Benny show, but uh it got nominated. Oh, you know, Jack Benny. Come on. Mm. <laughs> um so what I'm curious about, Steven, is the did rewatching this episode uh rekindle any desire to watch more of the Flintstones for you? I mean, it may it definitely hit the nostalgia buttons. Like I was like, oh man, Fred Flintstone and stuff. I I will say it did make me want to rewatch that movie. Uh, I don't know why. I just, <laughs> it's John Goodman and Rick Moranis doing their thing. Like I I could I could watch that. I think I do enjoy the aesthetic of the Flintstones, and I've always liked that. I like the creativity in the 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 gadgets that they have. Or what dinosaur mm. is performing what job, as horrific as that might seem. I love the idea mm-hmm. that when Wilma opens the fridge, she has to put on a big coat to go into it because it's like a giant <laughs> ice cave. That kind of stuff just yeah. tickles me. I love that, like, it was not steampunk. It was rock punk? I don't know what you would call yeah. it. Just <laughs> flipping old. Uh, there's something real fun about that to me, and I love it. And I do kind of wish we still had something like this around i wouldn't hate it if seth mcfarland did get his flintstones reboot he wanted you know um because yeah. I, don't, I don't know if you guys were familiar with that but there for a long while he was trying to re- do seth mcfarland's the flintstones and i don't think it ever mm-hmm. got off the ground unless i'm mistaken uh but it was swirling out there for a long long time and they were just like i don't want him to do family guy flintstones and i don't want that either um right but yeah, uh, it would that, be cool i to mean see today if if I if I had a worry about it today, my worry is that the humor would change, mm-hmm. and the type of humor would get more sardonic. Sure. And I like for Maybe, all the but... 
with what he's doing with the Orville and taking over the Star Trek mantle at this point, I'm like, yeah, I might have more faith in him doing something like that. That could be. Um, yeah. Amy, how about you? Did, did this make you want to watch any more of the Flintstones? Yeah. So it's funny because like you look at like, you know, I, I rolled so hard when we watched just the 10 of us, you know what I mean? But like, because this is so over the top and so far removed from anything, I'm like, yeah, you know what? Actually, I would watch this. <laughs> I would go back. That'd be fun. Because I mean, it's it's just nonsense. Be like, I can't believe that we did this at one time. <laughs> and, and I think some of it too is like, the jokes in just the 10 of us, some of them felt a little bit mean spirited. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas none of this, like this feels like it's, it's missing the mark, but it's like, it's wholesome in a way while it's missing the mark. Everyone's yeah. in on it. it makes any sense. Every, everyone yeah. in the show is in on the joke. You don't feel like it's at anyone's real mm -hmm. expense, even though it may be, they're playing it like they totally get it. And this is just the way we're going to roll with it. And it somehow makes it a little more comfortable than the more, the more mean jokes that kind of leave somebody out. You know, I don't, I don't know if you've ever watched any of the Harvey Birdman attorney at law. Um, but the mm. Fred Flintstone episode is the greatest episode of that show. It is ever. It is amazing where he's so uh, a crime boss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Godfather. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. It's going on the list. So good the stone father, I think, or whatever. Oh, it's <laughs> they're They're That's all over. So all of them are on HBO max. Uh, yeah. If you haven't watched Harvey Birdman, attorney at law, you have to, it's fantastic. I love that show. <clears throat> Audie, how about you? Did this, uh, this make you want to watch some more Flintstones? Yeah, probably. I mean, I, I feel like Steven, it's like it, it hit the nostalgia itch for sure. Um, I even remember, you know, Flintstones was one of those things where you where I would get the drawing book and learn how to draw the characters because they were simple enough to do. And, mm -hmm. you know, you could tell from this episode just how cheap the animation is for this show because they hardly move unless they need to. And, yep. you know, I see it now as a kid. You wouldn't see that. But, you know, no. there's a lot of I like standing it. and looking sideways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Only so much of their body ever moves ever. Yeah. Like, um, we don't do perspective. It's no, no. They've got three. Yeah. Yeah. They did have the one, the one shot where Gazoo is standing in front of Fred and Barney. And it's one of the few times I can remember ever seeing Fred and Barney from behind. Yes. Yeah. I did notice there was that. A different, there was a different perspective. It also allowed them to have the two of them in frame with Gazoo and only mm -hmm. have to animate Gazoo's mouth. So, right. Yep. Um, yeah, there was definitely like, and that's a Hanna Barbera thing, right? Uh, Hanna Barbera oh, yeah. had a lot of very uh, cost cutting methods of their. Uh, I was going to say, sure. just, just TV animation at the time. Copy yeah. paste just whole like characters. <laughs> Where Hanna Barbera mm -hmm. would just, just take him, yep. turn him sideways, remove his teeth, boom, new character, go. When we're going somewhere, the background is on a loop. <laughs> on a loop. Yep. On a yep. loop. Yep. Wacky races, and, man. That's the whole thing was built. And when yeah. you think about it, when everything has to be hand drawn, and hand mm -hmm. photo oh, yeah. frame by frame. Like totally yeah. makes sense that Hanna Barbera yeah. would do that. Because they were mm -hmm. Hanna Barbera put out a lot of content. Um, yeah, they did. Yeah. The no, Flintstones was their they did the Flintstones after was it uh I think it was Droopy Dog and Top Cat had come out before. Um, not not counting Tom and Jerry. And okay. they were trying to kind of recapture and, and Droopy Dog and Top Cat just didn't didn't land the way that they wanted. And so that's where they started coming up with the idea for the, the flagstones, which eventually became the Flintstones. So then they could make all kinds of absurd cartoon characters like Mo Gilla Gorilla mm -hmm. and stuff. Yep. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's great. All yeah. Those, um... Droopy Dog. I'm sorry. A cartoon that sounded like this all the time <laughs> didn't catch on with people. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dude, don't be so upset. <laughs> I can't do a Droopy Dog. I tried. It's close enough. It's good. Yeah. I mean, I, I will say that uh, I remembered the Flintstones being like better than it was, but I guess I haven't watched it since I was a kid. So clearly like my child uh, mind just kind of glommed onto like, oh, this is fun, silly cartoon. And it's, it's like the reverse that. of the Muppets, right? Where the Muppets have jokes that you don't get till you're a grown up. <laughs> this yeah. one, 
you get to be a grown up and you're like, where are the jokes? Where did they go? Where did they go? I remember that, jokes. Mm-hmm. That is a great way to put it. The Muppets aged better because the the way the humor was structured. This was like very mm-hmm. simple, low hanging fruit humor, and that that's the thing that was missing from it was yeah. that that feeling of like, oh yeah, no, I didn't I didn't get this as a kid, but I get it now. Yeah. It's like no, I got all of this as a kid because it was just very simple. The complexity was not a part of the Flintstones. That's nope. kind of what we're, we're driving at here. Yeah. Um, but it was still fun. Like I wouldn't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to slag on it and t- say it's terrible. It's a product of its time. Sure. There's some jokes that are like, eh. you know, the, the chicken one, the hens, yeah. that was the one that I kind of, I kind of backed up from the TV a little bit as I was watching it. Like, I don't, I don't mm. know. I don't like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that one felt little, bad. A little bit on the to nose there, guys. Credit. To their credit, Gazoo does it, and Fred and Barney are like, no, 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 no. Yeah, so, that's true. You know, they Fred and Barney knew right away that that was not a good idea. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I I do think that it was you know it's it's still fun. There's a reason that the characters of the Flintstones have lasted as long as they have, and all the yeah. different iterations mm-hmm. with a simple palette like that and a simple kind of base, uh, a bedrock, if you will. Of that, this, that, this series that. um you can go in so many different ways with it and it can get it because there's still i mean there there's they were making new uh tv specials and short run stuff all the way up through the late 90s um mm-hmm. some dino stuff and like what a cartoon mm-hmm. yeah on cartoon network and all that so I think it's a it's a fun show but definitely this was where it jumped the shark for sure uh-huh. uh, <laughs> And uh, so we're going to continue talking about jumping the shark for this, the next three episodes. And Audie, you're up next with uh, another shark jumping moment. What do you got for us next week? Yeah. So my first pick, I'm going to do an honorable mention for it because it was on Peacock, the free tier. And then today it went on the premium. And I was like, <laughs> okay, folks, <laughs> I love you guys, but I'm not going to make you pay Peacock because um i was gonna do a episode of sliders which was a sci-fi show back in the day one of the first uh we talk about multiverse all the time and they did it back then um and it was gonna be super cheesy and super fun so (laughs) my fallback uh which is actually on paramount plus i'm gonna go ahead and do the original star trek season three episode one spock's brain Oh yes. boy. <laughs> yes. So all of you, if you don't have Paramount Plus, go ahead and get it for a month and let's watch some Star Trek, y'all. I'm so excited. Can, I just recently started this. I just recently started watching like episodes every now and then of the original series because I've never watched Star Trek outside of the JJ Abrams movies. Don't hit me. Oh wow. <gasps> but they're a joy. Those shows are yeah. a joy. They are a slow moving march. Yeah. But man, <laughs> like if you can just relax your brain for a minute and just be like, don't look at your phone, just focus on the weird mm-hmm. colored hallways and stuff. Like uh-huh. it's great. Like what is that chess machine, that chess put thing they're playing okay. that's like stacked high? And, Steven? What is that? Steven, yeah. save yeah. it for next week. Save so it for excited. next week. I'm <laughs> so excited. <laughs> Let's do this. Excellent. Yeah. So next. So Paramount Plus, get yourself a, a month of that and watch which which episode again? Season Season three, the final season, episode one, Spock's Brain. All right. Spock's Brain. Watch some OG Star Trek, the original mm-hmm. series. A little little Kirk, little Spock. Who knows? Who knows who else is going to be there? Probably uh Uhura, I'm sure. I can't wait. So this is gonna be fun. This is gonna be yeah. fun. Uh so that is gonna be next week uh on this show. Those were the days. If uh, you enjoy the show and you want to watch us record it live, you can do that Monday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern time at twitch.tv slash two dorks TV. The show comes out uh, usually the next day, anchor.fm slash those were the days show uh, or anywhere you get your podcast. Just look for Audie's uh, awesome art of the four of us as uh, as a newspaper comic strip characters. I love it. I still uh, to this day just <laughs> absolutely love it. Um, and that's going to do it for this week. Uh, the Flintstones, the great gazoo, we are jumping the shark all month. Uh, so 
get ready. Get your get your leather jackets, your life jackets, and your water skis, because uh, we got sharks to jump, and we're going to do it. So until next week, Star Trek, Spock's brain. This has been Those Were the Days for Amy, for Audie, for Stephen, and me, TV Stravis. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Thank you.